stand as we sing to our Savior and King today. Well, good morning, everyone. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Um, last week, the youth threatened me, to, and they told me to get out, and they took over last week. I had nothing to do with it, guys. Did they do a good job? And Ken, they made him leave town. So anyway, it's good to be here, um, and hey, since I didn't preach last weekend, I'm all, all ready to go, and it's going to be a doubly long message today. Hey, I, this is an old, old kind of story or joke or whatever you want to say, but this guy told it pretty well, and I wanted to share with you this morning. A woman just returned to her home from an evening of church services when she was startled by an intruder. She caught the man in the act of robbing her home and its valuables, and she yelled, Stop! Acts 2.38. That verse says, Repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. The burglar stopped in his tracks. <clears throat> the woman call, calmly called the police, explained what she had done. As the officer cuffed the man to take him in, he asked the burglar, Why did you just stand there? All the old lady did was yell a scripture to you. He replied, Scripture, she said she had an axe and two 38s. <laughs> All right. There you go. Now you know how to handle someone breaking in. Or maybe you have an axe and two 38s. I don't know, but there you go. All right, guys. Um, it is good to have you. Hey, this Wednesday, this Wednesday, I want you to be here. I want everyone to come back for Wednesday. I know we usually have Paul's Kitchen and the, um, and the food and the classes and everything, but this Wednesday, we won't have any of that. We will have our service, and it will be an Ash Wednesday service. Some people say, well, I don't know what an Ash Wednesday service is, and I always tell them, well, you come and you'll figure it out. Um, but guys, if, if you're feeling like your spiritual faith is kind of cooled off, if you feel that you're wanting to connect with Jesus, but you just haven't done it yet, if, if there's stuff in your life that you know, you're having troubles with and you're trying, to, you're trying to live life by yourself, guys, let God be there for you. And this service is one of the most meaningful of all the services. And, so, and it's, it's different. It's very special. I believe that you will receive a blessing. And we have seen miracles happen in an Ash Wednesday service. So it's this Wednesday, 6 o'clock, okay? 
And I want all of you here. Don't say, well, you know, I usually do this on a Wednesday. I want you here for this worship on Ash Wednesday. All right? And it should last, I don't know, an hour, but it's important for you to be here. And so that's all I'm going to say about it. You make up your own minds, but I tell you what, do not miss out on the blessing. Katie, we've got several today. Good morning, everybody. I'm Katie Goodwin. Um, normally at Saturday, or sorry, what day of the week? Sunday evening service. So I love yeah. when I get to come visit. She, she, she plays the guitar for Sunday night service. One of them does. Sort of. Um, anyway, I want to talk to you guys about um, mom's ministry that we're starting up. Um, my friend Amanda Stone is partnering with me on it. She's not here this morning, but she'll be um, at our group time. So if you're a mama, I just wanted to invite you. We're going to be meeting twice a month, um, Tuesday evenings, the first and third Tuesdays from 6 to 7 during judo. So if you bring your kids to judo, just come on back. We'll be in the children's ministry area, and we will have child care just for um, mom's ministry ladies. And then the second and fourth Monday mornings, we'll have kind of the same class, just at different times. So if you're a stay-at-home mama, you just want to, somebody else to watch your kids for a little while in the morning, um, have some snacks, fellowship with some other moms, that's a great opportunity to do that. So we're really excited about this. It's been a while since we've had a mom's ministry here at the church, and um, I just want to remind you guys it's so important as mamas to, to get that spiritual nourishment for yourself, because you spend so much time pouring into little ones, pouring into big ones. Gosh, I have a 14-year-old daughter at home, too, and um, as moms, we just take care of other people. That's in our nature, right? How did so, she turn 14? That's not I, right. Mm, I wasn't watching. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks she's older. So um, we just want you to, to take this time to fellowship with other moms, to nourish your own spiritual self, and um, really just kind of take a, a minute out of your week twice a month to just take a deep breath and fellowship with God, too. And so we want to invite you to this. We'll have snacks. It'll be really great. Um, and also, if you are interested in maybe volunteering with our child care times, that's a need that we're filling right now, too. So if you want to serve mamas as they are um, studying the word in our meetings, then um, get with Janet, and she'll help you kind of go through that application process. But always definitely need nursery workers, too. So... Thanks, guys. Thank you. And uh, coming up, last week, the kayak camp applications came out, and they were put on the table out there. with. Uh, we thought that was perfect for the youth takeover weekend, and so they announced it. A lot of these disappeared. I was uh, <clears throat> sitting on a table at Paul's Kitchen on Wednesday, and uh, a delightful girl came up, and you know who you are. And she said, uh, where are the camp applications? I said, out on that table. She said, they're not out there. And Courtney Hearn, who was sitting right with me at, at the dinner, she said, oh, I took the last three that were out there. And I turned to the girl who loves camp, who loves it. And I said, sorry, babe, all the, all the places are taken then if all of them are gone. And she looked at me like, and then she's like, wait a minute, you're playing with me again. So yes, Delilah, there's applications out. <laughs> anyway, here is a video about our kayak camp. And, and bring your, your kids, your, if they have to be youth, middle school or high school. We have the two camps that kind of do a lot of stuff together there, same place. But anyway, um, and uh, bring friends. Um, let them come. Maybe they'll experience Christ because, you know, we have um, devotions in the morning led by our counselors. Then we have Vesper services at night. Then we have, we have grace before every meal. And it's just really a community um, that every, every day is a community that lives in the presence of Christ. There is a promised land waiting for me. Sometimes there's a notion that lies in between 
I'll keep on traveling the path where you've been Till I'm right where you want me That's where I will be Freedom's coming And it has a name Oh, no room for my chains Oh, you take them away Freedom's coming And it has a name And it is Jesus How sweet is the name You said it's for freedom that I was set free Now I walk in the victory That you won for me on the journey there on walls that you made I'll sing in the promise Cause you're making a way Freedom's coming And it has a name Oh no room for my chains Oh you take them away Freedom is coming And it has a name And it is Jesus How sweet is You saw that food line, how fast that went? That's exactly how it is. We did not speed that up. So, all right, we have, we have um, a missions team. Uh, Karen is uh, the team leader of that here at the church, and she's going to be talking a little bit about our local missions that we support. Hi, everyone. Um, Karen Kepke. It's not pronounced the same as it's spelled, so... Uh, I had the, the mission team, that, the mission team is, uh, handles more than 20-something missions or ministries that we, we oversee. We, um, there's a group of us, but I just want to let you know they're always welcome. This video that you're going to see is actually uh, for the local missions that we, hand, uh, we oversee. Uh, it's your tithing that actually helps support this. And we take uh, great pride and, and great uh, responsibility to make sure that uh, we try to reach others less fortunate, those who need help. If you're ever interested in actually attending one of our meetings, the time is actually shown. We usually meet six months out of the year. It's like every other month. Uh, and you're always welcome. Uh, if you just kind of wonder what is it all about, come find me and uh, we can talk. So... Enjoy the video.
All right, at this time, I'm going to invite Kevin. I mean, we have a lot of folks talking. I told you that. Um, just the way it was stacked up today. Um, but Kevin Wilson is our ad board chair, and uh, he's coming forward to share some words with you. Good morning. Uh, Chris asked me to speak about the disaffiliation and about our effort to raise funds to offset the debt because of the disaffiliation. Now, we've talked a lot about money the last several weeks in church, so I want to change it up a little bit and deliver a slightly different message. There's a quote by Heraclitus, who was a Greek philosopher. He said, day by day, what you do, what you think, and what you choose is what you become. What you do, what you think, and what you choose is what you become. Could not be more true. Average day, how many decisions do you think you make? Now, this is not my number. This was supplied. I did some research, came out from some university that studies this. So how many decisions do you think you make in a day? 100? 500? 1,000? Conscious and subconscious decisions, you make 35,000 decisions a day. Sounded a lot to me. Then they start breaking it down on what you do and how you think and where you're at. But you know what? You all made one very important decision today. You came to church. That's a huge decision. Now, I guarantee you in your mind, you had other choices. But you came to church. I had a mentor tell me a long time ago, Kevin, there's three kinds of people in the world. First kind of person is a victim. Everything that goes wrong in their life, everything they don't like, they have an excuse and somebody to blame. We all know the victim. We've sat next to him in the cafeteria at work, and after about five minutes, we're like, enough. Second kind of person is called a villain. These are people that do bad things intentionally. We've also worked and been around and associated with these people. They're not fun to be around. So there's a third kind of person. Third kind of person is called a victor. They're a person to look at the circumstances and the cards they've been dealt, and they say, you know what? I'm rising above it. I'm doing better. We're going to have problems in life. We're going to have challenges. We're going to have challenges and problems as a church. The disaffiliation, we can look at that as either being a victim or we can look at it as being a villain. It's going to pass. A year from now, we're going to be talking about something else. We're going to have other challenges. How do you want to live your life? Do you want to be, continue to be a victim? Do you want to be the villain? Because what this person told me, he said, Kevin, every day you play all three of those, whether you believe it or not. He said, you may think you're the victor. You're not. Every day we're all a victim. We're all a villain. But he said, if you really work at it, you can rise above it. I had lunch with a, uh, a very good friend this week, and he's also somewhat of a spiritual mentor for me. And we were share, he was sharing his life with me, and he said, you know, I haven't talked about these things for a while, and I've realized I've got a lot of regret. And I said, you know, a life lived without regret is not a life lived. We all got regret. If you don't, Good for you. I got plenty. But you know what? I'd rather be around people that got regret in their life and have lived that life and are learning from that regret and stepping above it and being better because those are good people, man. They're champions, and they're fun to be around. Somebody asked me a while back, Kevin, why don't you get a tattoo? I said, I got plenty of tattoos. Well, show me one. I said, what do you want to know? They said, well, you what do you want to know? I said, let me tell you something. I got enough physical and emotional scars that there ain't enough ink and enough artists to fill my body with a tattoo. Now, I've seen good artists, and I've seen good body work, and I'm not opposed to it. Don't get me wrong. Every one of you has got your own tattoos. There are, mer there are emotional scars, there are physical scars, there are mental scars that are burned into us, and we've got to rise above them. And all you've got to do is ask somebody. 
Man, you want to hear about somebody's story? They got stories, and it's phenomenal. I love talking to people, hearing their, seeing their tattoos. Don't live in the past. Today's message is about moving into the future. You can't live life fully if you live in the past. Learn from the past. Don't live in the past. My faith, and I'm just going to be brief on this, has been a journey. I grew up hating church. I didn't like getting dressed up. I didn't like the fact that my parents tithed because we didn't have a lot of money. And I didn't like the fact that a lot of people that I saw in church because I mowed their lawn, I delivered their paper, I did that stuff. And you know what? They were saints on Sundays and they were sinners on Monday and they were not good people. So I formed my own opinion and I started pushing away from organized religion and I pushed farther away and farther away. And then one day, <clears throat> I had my own relationship with God. I didn't give up on God. I spent a lot of time outside and that's my time with God still is outside of church. I commune a lot with God out there. And then one day at work, a uh, guy walks in, talks to the lady that worked with me and left. And I said, who is that? She said, oh, that's my pastor. And I said, he doesn't look like a pastor. And I looked out the window, he's climbing in a Jeep. I don't know, what the heck's up with that? So a couple weeks later, he's back talking to her. And this is 1994. It's a while ago. And uh, she brings him in. She said, Kevin, I want you to meet Chris. And I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, you go to church. And I said, no, I'm not into organized religion. And, I, and he said, that's okay. We're not really organized. <laughs> and <clears throat> I said, well, I don't like getting dressed up for church. He said, that's okay. You can wear jeans. And I'm like, dang it, two out of three down. I said, hey, I don't want this thing to be about money. He goes, I didn't ask you about any money. I just come in and try to church. My wife and my daughter started coming to church. I didn't for a long time. And then I started going because of my daughters. And gradually, I still have walls around me. Don't get me wrong. I don't like speaking in front of large crowds. I would still have problems with organized religion. And I sure am not here to tell you to tithe if you can't afford and don't want to tithe. But because of people like Bob, Dart, Ty, and Chris, 30 years ago, I wouldn't be up here talking to you. And there are better qualified people, don't get me wrong. If anybody wants to be ad board president, please see Chris. I'd be happy to step down if you, got, you can take the reins and run with it. So here's the deal today. Let's talk about We have to disaffiliate. We have voted to disaffiliate. We don't have to do anything. We voted as a church to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church and go on a separate path. That's a decision we make. Good for us. Let's be victors. Let's rise above and move ahead. Now here's a message on tithing. First of all, there are some people in our congregation that have a lot more month than they do money. And we have in our midst a resource here that I've not seen in any other church, and I think it's really cool. His name is Barry Sanborn. Barry's a quiet guy, sits out back, but he's a certified advisor, financial advisor for Dave Ramsey. And that's a big deal. So I talked to Bob and Ty and Chris, and I said, look, if people will go to Barry, and they will truly create a budget and stick to that budget and come to church and stay in church, can we help them a little bit with their bills? And they said, sure, yeah, we'll do that. But listen, I want to be clear to anyone taking advantage of this, because it is a hand up, not a hand out. And I want you to do this, but if you do it, you go all in. You don't do it halfway. Point number one. Point number two, if you don't feel called, I didn't tithe for a long time, because I didn't feel tithed. I might throw a few bucks in the in the basket or donate to a kid's event or something. But tithing is a special event, and it's, it's, a, it's an occurrence that occurs in your spiritual life and your faith life. And if you're not there yet, what I want to tell you is we accept you where you're at. Come to church. Take that chair, because the people that supported me when I was on my journey, and I'm still on a journey, they tithed so that I had a church to come to. 
They tithe so that my kids had programs to go to. They tithe so that I had a place to grow and develop. And I'm willing to invest in you all that are still wondering, do I tithe or not? So I'm looking at paying it forward right now because someday you're going to pay it forward to the next generation so that we can hear. Disaffiliation is going to pass. We'll be in a new chapter a year from now. It's going to be an exciting chapter. It'll be different, but it'll be fun. But come to church. Come to church. We we'll count on you if you can and want to tithe and you feel called to tithe and you're able to tithe, but don't feel compelled to tithe. No one should look down at anybody else in this church. We're all sinners. I am definitely. I'm on a faith journey that's been a gradual, very, sometimes painful, but very, very positive journey, and I'm taking little tiny steps at a time. And I want to encourage anybody that's out there doubting or not believing or having doubts, that's okay. That's okay. Come to church. You don't have to agree with everything Bob and Chris and Ty say. I don't sometimes. I'd never tell them that to their face, but I don't. <laughs> but you know what? There's sometimes a... It just, it's like, man, you're talking right to me. And it makes a difference. Come to church. Be a part of this church. This is a great place to be, and I'm so happy you're here. Thanks, Kevin. We have something fun coming up for you. We have a baptism, so I'm going to invite Caleb Robert Prosser to come up and bring anyone he wants with him. This is, this is comforting for a pastor. She comes up and says, he's just eating. I hope he doesn't spit up all over you. We did talk about it last week, so. Yes, we did. We did. Um, guys, um, this is one of our young couples that were in the church. Um, Jacob is in airborne in the army. He jumps out of perfectly good airplanes. Yeah. So we don't have to. Yeah. And, and this is Madison and his wife, and uh, they're living on base, North Carolina, North Carolina, and so they're still a part of our church. They watch online some and such, and anyway, here is their new addition. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so they, they were wanting to come and have... Yeah, we won one one ruin the picture there, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, once want you come over here. You want you come over here. Thank you. This You have to know this family, okay? First of all. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dearly beloved, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of His righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated in the fellowship of Christ's holy church. And remember, our Lord has given a place to these little children. Remember what He said, Let the little children come unto Me, and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. And parents, do you in presenting this child for holy baptism confess your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that he be brought up in the Christian faith, that he be taught the holy scriptures, and he learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? Will you endeavor to keep this child under the ministry and guidance of the church until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation 
and then be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. Say, we will. Don't, yeah, don't puke, okay? There, look there. <laughs> Caleb Robert, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I didn't like that. That's cold. Let's pray. Father, um, for these parents and this dear child, God, just be with them, I pray. May you bless this little baby. May he grow up to be a great leader for you and a person of faith. And uh, God, um, just may, as they're in uh, North Carolina and away from us, but we can still be their church um, for them and behind them and pray for them. And right now, God, just send angels to be with him in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, he's looking right at Mama. Well, there you go. One of our new ones. Will the ushers please come forward? Well, folks, if you're with us for the very first time, just allow the offering plates or the, the baskets to pass you by. We're just very excited that you're here. Thank you for attending. But for the rest of us who have said, this is our church, this is when we give. And we give uh, out of cheerfulness. Um, and uh, I know that when we are people of faith, that other people are blessed. Father, um, be with us as we come this morning into worship, and may you indeed bless this offering and these tithes as they go to so many things, both missions and ministries here and around the world. Amen. Well, in, uh, in our prayers today, we do have a new addition. No, not the Prosser baby. That was announced a little time back. We have another new addition, uh, born last night, in fact, Silas J. Drummiller. Um, and uh, Jesse and Rachel are the parents. Rachel actually sings 
in the early service uh, praise team, and last night, or and I sent I sent her a thing said, well, it's okay if you take a week off singing. It's I'll, I'll allow it. And she was like, ha ha ha, thanks a lot, you know. But six pounds, fifteen ounces. So congratulations to them. They're probably watching online right now. Um, and then uh, others, um, you know, baby Ellis. I call her that right now. But baby Ellis is in Kansas City Mercy Hospital, um, the Children's Mercy up there. Um, and if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, um, they were trans they were up there because they had seen some things that were going to need a surgery on the baby. So the mom delivered her baby up there. Certainly not any of the plans that she had. And about a day later, they did surgery on the baby, and the baby came through just fine. And I want you to know uh, she's doing very well. They've taken her off most everything that she was on. Um, and probably this week, um, sh she'll be home. So praise God for that. <clears throat> I want you to pray for the youth. A lot of our youth are taking off at 1 o'clock and heading out to Tulsa for, I don't know, something. What is it? Winter jam. I love jelly and jams. It's winter jam. Um, anyway, it's kind of a spiritual thing for them. Um, also then, uh, B.J. Knutson, he, uh, he attends the um, early service and, and he goes to our men's lunch. He is in the hospital uh, with an infection. Um, we do have uh, um, my wife, Rhonda. She had a full knee replacement. It's been kind of rough on her, um, but she's home watching. Hi, honey. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we pray for her for complete recovery. She's doing pretty well um, today. It was going to be a real good day, I think, for her. Um, and so also, if you would, uh, Pam Dart's having surgery uh, tomorrow morning. So um, pray for that as well. Let's, uh, let's join together. Holy Father, as we come into your holy place, we invite the Holy Spirit to come. To come upon us and be around us and be within us. That indeed, God, you just stay here for a while. And the folks come here today, they come wanting a blessing. And so may the Holy Spirit give them that blessing that they know they've been in the house of faith. They've been in the house of the Lord and great things have happened. God, we give you thanks for our, our new infant in the church we, uh, um, and many more to come coming up. And so, God, we also pray for those that are needing um, healing that we've shared but also, God, I know there's a lot of people in the congregation that might be going through a very difficult time. The things they're worried about and they stay up at night about. Some maybe didn't get the greatest report from a doctor. Some are hurting for other reasons. But God, you give them the strength. You be there for them, I pray, and give them comfort during these difficult and dark times. And may they come up out of it. And may we be a part of that recovery. May we be there to offer them um, a hug and a conversation and prayer. Be with us, I pray. Lead us and guide us as we move into the, the uh, praise and music that we sing to you, O God. Bless us all, I pray. We all say... Amen. Will you rise?
your name is powerful today. We come to worship you. We come to give you our love, give you our praise, and give you our worship today. Now bless your messenger. May we hear his words. May we listen. May we continue in this service. In your name we pray. Amen. I've started a series of messages on Saul, or as he, we would know him, Paul, the Apostle. Um, two weeks back, I did the first one, and then those kids, those pesky kids, kicked me out. Um, but uh, we went and talked about Saul early on. He was young. He, had, uh, he was a Roman citizen from Tarsus. He uh, was sent to Jerusalem to train under the, the best rabbi ever kind of the, like the Yale Divinity School or something, he was trained under this, this rabbi there, Gamaliel. 
which is still a famous name amongst the Hebrew people. And he became a Pharisee. He was brilliant. He was zealot for his faith. And it's interesting, now the Bible does not teach us this. So this is just Chris talking. But he would have been in the same Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. It's a good possibility that Paul, as a Pharisee, wearing all his robes and such, would have gone out and heard Jesus preach. I mean, they were in the same town together at the same time, and Jesus was a, such a draw. Thousands of people would come out to hear Jesus preach. And they, we know that Pharisees were present, present because they would always like say little comments under their breath, or they would ask Jesus questions um, trying to trap him. And so maybe, I don't know, but maybe Paul was out there hearing Jesus preach at times. We just don't know. Well, Saul was a rising star in the Hebrew faith, and uh, he became the chief persecutor of the early church. You're thinking, wait a minute, we're talking about Apostle Paul who built up the church and wrote a third of the New Testament? Yes, that guy originally was a persecutor of the church and tried to tear it up. Now, you know, I, I have this view that if your religion tells you to hate other people, you need to find a new religion. Amen? I believe that the Christian faith, biblical Christian faith, now we get this, biblical, staying with the Scriptures, biblical faith never harmed anyone. Now, yes, I've had atheists argue with me all the bad things that Christianity or other religions or whatever have done. I'm like, you know what? I take that. I own it. I, I understand that. But biblical Christianity, when lived out, never harms anyone. And so anytime that a group harms others in the name of religion or in name of a faith or whatever is wrong. Um, Back years ago, do you remember um, a group um, uh, that were in, in uh, was it, uh, I think it's Topeka, but the Westboro Baptist Church? Remember that? I was always like, thank you, they didn't call themselves Methodist. And the Baptists went like this every time that the Westboro Baptist Church showed up. They weren't really Baptists, they weren't claimed by any Baptist group, they just what they called them. It was a large family. And they had all their kids go to law school. And this is how they made their money is they go to places, be so obnoxious that the police or the sheriff or people of a building or a church would manhandle them. And then they'd sue you. You know, we've had people down here at the bottom of the street and they were protesting and such. And they had signs. I don't know exactly what they were because I've never down there. Our people have been down there. And I said, just leave them alone, wave at them, smile. You know, they'll get tired of messing with us. Um, we even had someone that ran out cold water. It was a summer day, so they ran out cold water for them to drink. That's the way Christians handle that kind of thing. Now, if they'd come up on our land or something, yeah, we would have done something. Um, but here's the Westboro Baptist Church. This is the, and, and they actually looked through a bunch of pictures, and this was the less obnoxious of all of them. Um, but they would go to our soldiers' funerals, the ones that came back from Afghanistan in the caskets. And these yahoos would show up to their funerals and yell and scream while the funeral was going on. And that's why the uh, motorcycle groups, um, um, were they glory riders? Is that what they call them? Huh? The guard. The guard? Okay. Anyway, they would pull up and separate these guys from the people at the funeral that were hurting. Um, and I just can't imagine ever doing that kind of thing. I don't care what your stand is. Leave the grieving alone. 
But anyway, they'd go places. And remember, uh, they, they came, they were supposed to show up for the, when the President Obama came after the tornado here in Joplin. In fact, they had already made statements that Joplin deserved the tornado. Yeah, I know. But they were supposed to show up, and uh, I was like, oh, geez. Um, you know, after the tornado, everyone's nerves were raw here, and I was worried about their safety. People, to, you know, grab them out of a car or something. But anyway, they were on their way here. This is the story, and I guess this is a factual. They were on their way here, and they stopped off at a convenience store somewhere in Kansas, fairly close. And some of the truck drivers, it wasn't a convenience store, it was a truck stop. And so some of the truckers, God bless them, uh, some of the truckers found out who they were and why they were there and where they were going. And so they took their big rigs and they surrounded their cars. Nose to nose. And then they just walked away from their trucks for a few hours so that if a sheriff or whatever was called, the sheriff would come out and say, hey, are these your trucks? I don't know. We're just here having coffee. I don't know where whose trucks those are. And so they kept them there. There were a couple that came in a different group. They showed up over here, but most of them were kept back. But see, they hated people. And yet they called themselves a Christian. Well, Paul was Jewish, and a a leader being a Pharisee, but his faith, it turned into hatred and to harm. Here, here's the story, or at least one of the stories, of where Paul was persecuting the church. It's in uh, Acts chapter 6. Now Stephen, and it talked about Stephen earlier, so if you want to do some reading on your own, read the first part of chapter 6. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. So he could do, in the power of Jesus, he could do miracles. Opposition arose against him, but in verse 10 it says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. And so in verse 12, they stirred up all the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was kind of the ruling council, 70 men, uh, the ruling council of Jerusalem and much of Judea. Most were religious figures. All of them were Jewish. Some of them were business owners or very powerful people in Jerusalem. Many of them were Pharisees. It does not say Paul was ever part of the Sanhedrin because he was still a young guy. It was mainly your older. And then Sadducees would be part of it, and some of the priestly class would be part of the Sanhedrin. Remember, the Sanhedrin was the one that also condemned Jesus to death. Well, they produce false witnesses. Guys, do you remember? One of the Ten Commandments is do not give false testimony. That's one of their big ten. And yet they broke it to get rid of Jesus and then later Stephen. But later, it goes on and uh, they, they accused him of all kinds of things. In, chapter, or in verse 15, it says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like that of an angel, just like mine. <laughs> that, didn't, that, that didn't sell very well, did it? Well, because it's at a courtroom in the Sanhedrin, Stephen is allowed to speak. And Stephen goes through the Old Testament. You can read it at home sometime. He goes through the Old Testament, and what he's showing is this line that's moving through the Old Testament that is pointing towards the Messiah, pointing towards Jesus Christ. And so he goes from the Old Testament and all the way through it, and here, here is a, a, a copy of the Hebrew scroll. If you don't know Hebrew and you'd like to see what it looks like, come on up after service. And then he goes through the Old Testament leading towards the time of Jesus. And then he says, and this Jesus, this Savior, this Messiah, he came. And then he turns around and says, and you killed him. At that point, 
they were furious. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him, ground their teeth. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Son of Man is a phrase meaning Jesus, or, you know, the Savior. At this, they covered their ears and they yelled at the top of their voice. It's kind of like these, these kids, you know, when they don't want to hear something. Remember that? They used to go, no, 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 I can't hear you. This is what they were doing. And they rushed at him, and they dragged him out of the city, and they began to stone him. Um, and I've talked about how this was done several times, so I'll keep it short. But for those that don't understand it, um, they would take rocks about a baseball or softball size. And wh the why they used rocks, it's like the Ozarks. There are rocks everywhere, right? And so they were handy, and they're a great way to kill. And so they would drag them out of the city. They didn't want the blood in the city. Public works frowns on that, you know. They drag him out of the city, and they all grabbed rocks as they got out of the city. And they pushed him some. They, um, you see him in a little hole here. Um, occasionally they would do that. Sometimes they push you off a cliff first and then stone you. But some of them they just would haul off and they'd throw stones. Their intention at first was to hit the neck down. And it was kind of a torture. Have you ever been hit by a rock? Most of you boys have. Rock fights. Yes, I was hit. It hurts. But when this person is kind of mangled, bones are broken, skin is, is off because it's been struck hard with a sharp rock, and they're bleeding, and they're hurting. And then towards the end, when they finally crumple to the ground, then you're allowed to throw it point blank, if you want, right into their face and their head to kill them. Meanwhile, get, get this, this is a very important section of Scripture for this story. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the first introduction of Saul and now right now he is an enemy of the church and the reason they would lay their cloaks at Paul's feet or Saul's feet at this time he was a Pharisee he was trusted and it says a young man so we know that he was you know pretty much out of getting his doctorate probably in Hebrew literature and so they lay their cloaks there. there's two reasons for that one cloaks or binding. You don't see in baseball where the pitcher goes out in his warm-up jacket and starts throwing with his warm-up jacket on, right? He takes that off so he can really be open and limber and he can throw it. Also then, they wouldn't want those cloaks. Cloaks were very expensive. These outer wear, very expensive. And if you got blood splatter on you, which it could get pretty nasty later on, and you throw a rock or someone else would and it'd splatter up so they took those off so they'd be safe and they trusted this man Saul to watch their expensive clothing Saul was there Saul saw it all happen in fact it says while they were stoning him now I always had to be careful when I was a youth director um, you couldn't just say Stephen was stoned for obvious reasons, every kid would go. <laughs> <laughs> While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And I like how they said fell asleep. He died. But remember, people of faith know that when we die, we don't really die. We go to be with the Lord, right? And so he fell asleep there. He woke up in heaven. 
And in chapter 8, it starts out with the story of Saul. It says, and Saul approved they're killing him. And I believe that Paul probably had remorse. You know, after he came to Christ, and we're going to talk about that next week, a huge change in his life. But I believe that he always had some remorse. He always had some guilt over the killing of Jesus. You know, him being a Pharisee, he could have gone, or not Jesus, but, but Stephen, he could have gone out and said, whoa, 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 let's not do this. Let's hang on. But no, he was there in his robes and he would put his hands over his chest like this and he was approving it. He was like, yeah, get him. And I always wonder, did he have the guilt over what happened? Because you know, him and Stephen could have been friends. After his conversion, he and Stephen would have been best of buddies and they'd been working for Christ together. And yet he had this on his life that he killed one of the leaders of the early church. In fact, he later persecutes more and more people in the faith. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says this, he writes this, now remember this is after his conversion, now he's a chief builder of the church, and he says, here is a trustworthy saying, that deserves full acceptance. In other words, all believers should say, yep, this is right. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And this is a room of sinners. I'm a sinner. Kevin Wilson, who talked to you earlier, is a sinner. And I know my congregation pretty well. You all are sinners too. We have been forgiven and saved. But we are sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us. And here, here's where I know that He carried guilt throughout His time here because he says of whom i am the worst here is the for the early church early church this is the apostle paul everyone looked up at him and said wow and he says guys jesus came to save people like me he came to save people like you he came to save sinners and he says i'm the worst in other words, I've done far more to harm than any of you guys. And I imagine he's remembering back to the time of stoning of Stephen and the other persecution that he did towards the believers in the early church. And you know, sometimes we live with regret. Every one of us can name a time that we had a lapse of judgment that we could have done something and handled it better. That we wish we could do over. You know, in sports sometimes, play yard sports, we go, okay, do overs. Makes everyone happy. That play didn't happen. We'll just do it over. I wish we could go back and change things. I wish we could have do overs. But unfortunately in life, once it's done, it's there. And some live with guilt and regret and hurt, and pain. And sometimes, my friends, that's us. But He's not done with us. Out of 2 Corinthians, I want to share, Paul writes this, and I believe he's kind of writing it to himself too. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... They are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. In other words, once we give our faith to Christ, things are different. Things are changed. I want to, I want to tell you, try, if you have never followed Christ yet, begin to follow Him and things will happen. Things will change in your life. Amen? 
They will. I promise you. But the old is gone, the new has come. And that's the life with Christ. And He understood that too. And He wants it for all of us. And sometimes we would like to have a second chance. And we, I've actually had people say, I don't think God can ever love me. I say, why? Because what I've done. I'm like, I'm here to say, guys, as your pastor, where you've been, what you've done, who you are, does not matter. What matters is your future. And I, as your pastor, want you to have a future with Christ and a church that you're active in. And God will bless you immensely. My favorite to sing, and long ago, I don't even remember when I got it. It was not even here at this church. I think it was back in Eagle Rock where I pastored. But God will take you where you're at. So you don't have to be a saint to be a part of a church. God will take you where you're at and move you to where you need to be. Right? In fact, I would say, and move you to where He wants you to be. And it will happen. It's amazing, but it will happen, my friends. Um, I had this article. It, it, it's several years old, but I thought I'd share it with you. The next time you feel like God cannot use you, just remember, Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was ugly. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied Christ. The disciples all fell asleep by praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced many times over. Zacchaeus was too small. And Paul was too religious. And Lazarus? Well, Lazarus was dead. And it ends by saying, now, no more excuses. God can use you to your full potential. Besides, you aren't the message. You are just the messenger. And God's waiting to use you for full potential. And I say that's where God takes you, like all these people. God took them where they were and moved them to where He wanted them to be. Well, I hope you're here next week as we continue on with this. I want to I, I wanna do something. I want to have an invitation today. Paul found Christ. Shoot, I was not a believer. I was hostile to churches. I found Christ. Kevin Wilson's kind of testimony. He wasn't about to come, but I kept taking away his excuses. And you know, you may have some excuses of why you don't do, want to do this or why you do that. They're just excuses. I want to invite you, if you want to know Christ, maybe you're trying to live for yourself and it's not working. Maybe you're trying to do it all by yourself and it's just wearing you out. You don't have to do that. I believe that when someone comes forward, they, that, that God meets them before they even get here. If you want that kind of experience, I invite you to come up. You can pray and spend some time here. I invite you to come. Let us stand and sing. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all people. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and share with them all that I've given you. Amen. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He.